Yes. Is that right? Better. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Horizon's Global Meeting, where we're going to be talking today about how we will change the way in which we do things in the world, economically, socially, as well as our mindset, and also in changing our skills development to cope with the new environment, because this pandemic has changed the whole way in the way we look at the world. Um, starting off today's session, we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to Peter Laszlo. Uh, Peter is a future-driven catalyst, a serial entrepreneur, and he has invested in tech companies and has tried to make powerful and impactful changes across the entrepreneurial development. He is genuinely passionate about supporting entrepreneurs, and he likes to think the unthinkable and act differently. He is currently the manager of Velaco, a private investment company, a founding partner, partner in Sports Science, a hype foundation, top 50 global sports data innovation company, and a founding member of Other Dots, a UK foundation with a focus on building a triple bottom line between the people, the planet, and the profit. Hand you over to Peter Laszlo. Thanks, Matri. Good morning, everyone from Milan. Um, to set the scene for our conversation, I, I, what I want to do is share my thoughts from an entrepreneurial perspective. And as we begin a new journey in this unprecedented, fragile, but exciting times, um, we live in a fascinating and beautiful world. And the global pandemic um, forcing a, a, a new norm, it offers an incredible opportunity for countries to rethink their resilience and supply chains, their domestic manufacturing cap capacity, and the innovation around it. However, to do so, we need to challenge and change our mindsets to think the unthinkable. Drones dropping off Amazon packages at the front of your door, digital menus at restaurants, algorithms buying and selling stock and applying loans, driverless cars and trucks, taking you and your goods to their destinations. These are no longer ideas for the future. They are just some of the ways automation is impacting the workforce today. And more developments are expected in the months ahead. In many ways, technological advances like these are inevitable and making perfect business sense. So what is it all, uh, all these changes add up to? Well, it, it's being called the new digital economy. And while it may be inevitable, there are many things that are need to happen if we don't uh, uh, prevent and, and cause chaos and disarray. But the question is if we have the human capacity to appreciate, firstly, the scale of disruption and unthinkables, then to make the profound readjustments that are so needed today. One thing is certain, that the future of work is entrepreneurial. I say this because... Most entrepreneurs are creative and solve problems that grow in complexity as their businesses grow in size. And they have to. Um, I, I, and, and they have a wide set of, uh, of skills that requires a significant amount of soft skills that future workers will require. So where, where am I heading with all of this? My point is that entrepreneurs are essential to the global economy as they are future orientated and they don't get distracted by short term pressures. And in a world of 24 hour news cycles, uncertain geopolitical economic environments and disruptive technology, entrepreneurs offer important lessons for us all. They're spotting opportunity, making smart short term sacrifices, unlocking new innovation and demonstrating the power of a long term vision. And along the way, they're helping build a robust economic future for us all. And this is what we are doing with my foundation, Other Dots, with untapped entrepreneurial potential from around the world. Thanks, Mastery. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, it was quite interesting. We are really heading to different times with drones and stuff like that. Uh, Saju, um, I'd like you to introduce you to Saju. Saju is a founder, chairperson, and MD of IAD Aerospace, 
a leading employee owned aerospace startup development in Bangalore, India, that works on the next, next generation of satellites, launch vehicles and drones. Prior to this, he headed a European engineering company in India. Earlier, he was an investment manager in Abu Dhabi based sovereign wealth fund investing into renewable energy assets in Europe. Saju, uh, good morning and welcome to Horizon's global meeting. And I'm sure you can provide us more insights into some of the things Peter picked on, like drones and how these kinds of technologies will be affecting our future. We can't hear you. I can't. I can't. Yeah, I can't hear you, Saju. Thank you, Mesri, and thank you, Peter. Uh, I would like to look at the future of farming, the essential work, and its intersection with technology, specifically in the context of India, and how it would enable food security for India's 1.36 billion people. As you all know, India is an agrarian economy. However, agriculture is only 16% of the GDP, but it is the largest sector for employment in India. Approximately 58% of the population's livelihood depend on agriculture. In comparison, in the United States, less than 2% of the population grows food sufficient for 2 billion people. I believe the future of farming or the future of work in farming in India would be technology platform driven like Amazon, Flipkart, uh, Airbnb model or farm services and products aggregator. Let me walk you through the future of Indian farming as I would see it unfold. It's early May in 2025 and it is the start of the Karif or the summer crop in Karnataka, which is in the south of India. Imagine Chandan, a technology CEO in Bangalore, registered as a farmer on the farm aggregator platform, looking to grow rice, a summer crop. The platform helps him to identify the ideal plot to grow rice closer to his hometown. He leases a one acre farm in Tumkur in his hometown for that summer crop from a registered landlord on the platform who is another techie living in the United States. From his aggregator mobile, Chandan subscribes to the services of the weather company, which is an IBM business unit, which provides hyperlocal weather information to him about the lease plot, along with data on soil moisture and temperature. It also gives him the schedule for a full summer crop cycle, like soil preparation, sowing, planting, spraying of fertilizer, pesticides, and harvesting. That platform-based seed seller will participate in an online auction to sell the seeds or plants to Chandan. The aggregator app will also connect him to the farm labor, the tractor service provider, the drone surveillance provider, the precision spray drone service provider, all of them registered on the platform and will help him in the crop cycle at various times. The platform will also enable him to find a buyer for the crop through an auction, along with the logistics provider for the transportation of the crop. I think this is the future of farming in India. I think this is the model to reimagine farming and address the farmer distress. It is also a model to reduce farm wastage too. Thank you, Mr. Okay, thank you, Saju. That is from the agricultural perspective. We are going to meet Arvin Upal, who is going to give us an understanding from the consumer uh, uh, perspective. Arvin Upal is the chairman of Whirlpool India. He also sits on a number of public listed boards like the Gulf Oil Lubricants, AXO, Nobel India, Tuscan Adventures, and an industry advisor to Advent International. He is credited with the dramatic turnaround of the Whirlpool operations in India. He's an astute strategist and a game changer and a mentor to many startups. Arvind, please, your input into how this will affect us going forward. So, Maitri, 
everyone. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk. Uh, some confessions to start with. I am no guru on predicting future trends and so on. Uh, I'm just an operating general manager who's worked several years in the consumer area. So I'm just going to try and uh, kind of apply my mind to how I see things in the consumer area. Uh, you know, we live in a very competitive world. And uh, there's an old saying that, you know, change is the only constant. So, yes, the world, the area of workspaces have been changing constantly. Uh, but the old world always tends to slow down the new world. And I'm going to say things here which probably may offend a few people, but uh, it's not my intention. It's just the way I see things. Uh, in my view, the world has been changing. And it has been changing from what I say as a man's world. It has been gradually evolving to a woman's world. And this change has, has been a slow evolutionary process. But the old world always slows down the new world. So, for example, men have created offices for men to work in. Uh, but every now and then you have a cataclysmic event. And we are facing one right now where all across the world in one clean swoop, the whole world is facing the same event at the same time. And I think it has, uh, it is going to drive a few changes in the way we work and operate and the way we uh, live as consumers. One of the changes that I see coming definitely, and I will talk specifically about its impact in India as I see that. You know, there's a lot of talk about work from home. Uh, it's almost become a bad word now because People are locked down at home, so it seems like you're working from home, locked down in a cage. So I'm, I'm not going to call it work from home. I'm going to call it work online. So there, we are going to move to a world which is working online vis-a-vis -vis working from office spaces. Working from office spaces is an ecosystem which is created by men for men. And why do I say that? Because uh, typically men, uh, men tend to be much more focused. Uh, they they are better at performing one task at a time. And therefore, workspaces were created to give undivided attention to a task. And it was ideal, it was ideal for men to operate in. Men are finding it very difficult to work from home because in the work, it's very difficult. In the house, it's very difficult to operate with so many distractions. Women, on the other hand, are multitaskers. And suddenly what's happening is that this whole working from home culture is far more adaptive for women to operate in than for men to operate in. I'll just park that as one thought. The other thing is that if I take the case of India specifically, we have a very large pool of educated women who are not part of the workforce today, simply because they've taken on the, the, the role of being the homemaker. So the men go to the office and the women are taking care of the family and uh, children at home. The moment you do work from home, I think it brings uh, it brings into the workforce a very large uh, segment of uh, women workforce. What are the implications of that? Because what it means is that suddenly you will have a very large white collar. And I'm not just talk I'm talking of a white collar workforce, uh, women workforce, which did not exist. Uh, today, a lot of the purchasing and the consumer purchases that happen are driven by, by male behavior because they are the main bread earners. But the moment the woman becomes a bread earner, a lot of choices of purchases are going to be driven by what she wants specifically. So I think uh, it's going. there are ecosystems which are going to change. There's an office ecosystem which is going to slow down, a home ecosystem which is going to start, uh, economic emancipation for white-collar women is going to increase. Uh, so it's going to require more home automation because uh, if everyone starts to work, then you need definitely more. So I just think it's going. To, there are events happening out there. We are just at the early cycle of that. And the only thing that's happened is that this was happening slowly and may have taken another 50 years to happen. I think now in the next five years, it is going to be very much a part of our lives and we're going to have to adapt to this. Uh, business models will die 
and new business model will adapt, have to adapt to this new ecosystem. So I'm just going to pause uh, with that and pass it back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Arvind. Um, our next speaker is Lena Sovold, and she is a clinical psychologist and a mental health advisor based in Norway. She is passionate about promoting mental health, well-being, socio-economic skills, empowerment, and sustainable leadership across the different projects and contexts that she is currently involved in. She is very much involved in the healthcare and e-learning, as well as within the work and school places. Lena, good morning and welcome. I see there's a lot of questions about people in mental health popping up as well. So the forum is yours. Thank you very much, Maitri. So these times of crisis and disruption is challenging for our human mind. Lena, you are very soft. You're very, very soft. Um, I know I know that my sound is bad, but I will just try my best. To, I hope it will come through. Okay, all right. So, so we are facing right. a, a growing mental health crisis, which clearly highlights the importance of protecting and promoting the mental health and well-being of the workforce. Although there is an um, emerging change in awareness among business leaders about this, leaders should continue to take more responsibility when it comes to putting mental health at the forefront of their agenda in the times to come. They should also commit to reducing stigma about mental health about mental health issues also, and foster a culture of openness and support. This will help build much needed individual and organizational resilience and help promote job satisfaction and production. So the global crisis and rapid digitalization uh, that we are facing has given us invaluable cues to skills needed to navigate the emerging future of work. There will be two general skill sets that will be needed across sectors. Technological skills to be able to navigate and use the emerging technologies effectively and interpersonal skills like compassion, empathy, as well as ability to collaborate and communicate effectively. This will especially be needed within healthcare, but also across all sectors. And as AI takes on more routine-based work, these skills will be even more needed, and we will see more meaningful work uh, starting to emerge. And a broad and flexible skill set, in addition to only specialized skills, will also be favorable. The leader should uh, step up and uh, really offer to reskill employees when needed and, and invest in their ongoing professional and personal development. The existing global challenges has also highlighted the importance of a flexible, curious and creative mindset and a willingness to learn and ability to adapt to the changing environment and demand. Both interpersonal skills and creativity is something that will be very difficult for AI to copy or master. Uh, this also shows the need of transforming our educational system and teach young people the skills that will really be needed in the future. So we need to build the future of work on values of trust, collaboration, inclusion and transparency. And we need to select and reward leaders who embody 
this kind of mindset and quality. We also need leaders who are innovative, brave, and willing to lead with humbleness and compassion while also considering the greater whole of people and planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, I'd like you to introduce you to Muriel Solange Bollet. She is the founder and CEO of MSB and Partners and the creator of Empathic Strategies. She works with decision makers from business, politics, academia to enhance personal and collective growth. She has 12 years of coaching, including Fortune 500. She's an author of Modern Leadership Styles and Outdoor Training. She has media professional and hosted over 800 shows on the business channel Cash Daily, traveled to 40 countries, and is also a competitive athlete. Mural Solange Bay is a Reiki master specialist, as well as a theater healing practitioner, and she is a MIT certified in digital transformation, including AI, IoT, cloud, blockchain, and cybersecurity. Good morning, Muriel, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. So this is really early mornings for us here in Switzerland. That's where I'm tuning in from. And I am so extremely excited to be on this panel because, you know, the changing future of work to me is something that I'm so about you know exchanging thoughts and 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 visions with just you know human beings around the globe and i would like to start with a recommendation so if you have something to write like analog or <laughs> digital i would recommend to write you down write down um this book title which is called the future is faster than you think by peter h diamandis and stephen Kotler. And I happened to, you know, listen to this audiobook probably like two months before I knew that I was participating on this channel. And it was really impressive to dive into this possibility of how our lives might look like in the future. And it really talks about how converging technologies are, you know, transforming our business, our industries and and, you know, most, most importantly, our lives just in general. And it talks about or it dives into like the topics of transportation, if you're interested in that, health, retail, also education, advertising, entertainment, and then, of course, food and finance. So this is like really the, the whole experience provides a present look at our, you know, impending future. And we all know that this repetitive work will be sooner or later be replaced by all these, you know, great technologies and they become smarter and smarter. And what they do is they do make space for us human beings to reinvent ourselves. And I think that is just from me talking to all kinds of different peoples, different levels, different sectors, different industries is really a huge question mark like you know what do we do with ourselves then if machines are taking over what we are doing now right and so my contribution to this panel i want to put a probably more philosophical angle onto it and just taking the title again like hashtag change hashtag future i want to skip those two and really put emphasize on the word work so we still call all activities that we do in exchange for money work. But now how does the word work make us actually feel? It's you know, usually related to stress, to pressure. It's a lot of have tos, like the external world is you know, asking and demanding so much from us, but then also our ego you know, drives us internally. And it's like this image that we might want to represent in the outside world. And this is just all together kind of like a low vibration that we consciously or unconsciously bring together with work. But then, of course, we human beings are also smart, at least sometimes. <laughs> and we cover this whole thing up with two words. And this is where confusion starts. One, 
is responsibility, and two is purpose. So if we have all these low vibrations covered up with these very honorable words, responsibility and purpose, what we actually create with this merge is, you know, a, a huge confusion within ourselves, right? And the interesting thing is, you know, talking to hundreds, maybe thousands of leaders, it always comes, or I always come to the same conclusion. And, and it's so interesting. Every single human being wants to break out of this golden cage. All we strive for, and this is really, every human being has exactly the same story coming from different you know, angles, but everyone is striving for freedom, for fulfillment, and holistic success, meaning like having an internal, but also external you know, experience of success, which all together leads to this well-being that we often talk about. And we're still talking about the word work. So if not work, then I was asking myself, well, what then? Right? What's what's like the the opposite or like what, what would like give us all this freedom and fulfillment and holistic success? And it really all comes down to the co, which stands for the collaboration part, creation. Right? Co-creation and authentic co-creation is even a higher form of co-creation, um, which I believe is really freeing ourselves to be in this, you know, state of freedom, fulfillment, and success. And I'm just going to repeat these three, three over and over because it is this deep desire we just all have. And, and in business, we usually, you know, talk about creativity, we talk about innovation, but what we do is we go up into our headspace and then we try to be creative and innovative from here. But honestly speaking, I think the time has come where we, this can still be active and it should be active, but most importantly is that space here. We should start talking about heart space and heart shift and heart set. Right? What is our heart set in this whole thing? And where do we want to go? This, this is like the really biggest question. Um, and how do I know whether I'm here or here really requires one very essential thing is, you know, what is my human identity? Who am I? What is my essence, my individual part that I bring to, to this world? And then differentiate it from the tech ID which is all the digital traces that we leave behind and that, you know, in the near and mid or long-term future is more and more influencing our decisions that we take in the future based on like, you know, um, advertisement that is just, you know, adjusted to our behavior that we left behind and so on and so forth. Um, and that there is one other thing that, <clears throat> that I want to address, and this is what I want to leave you with, is we often ask, ask ourselves, you know, why do we talk about this? Why is this important? Why <clears throat> do we need to do this? But there is something to that word why, which, which is so big in, in the business world. Simon Sinek with his golden circle has pushed that very much. But it leaves us with a because. So there is why followed by because, and because triggers a defense mechanism. So if we talk about heart space, defense is the opposite of what our hearts and our you know, desire to connect really wants. We want to be open. And in order to be open, there is one question. It's the number one question always that we should ask ourselves is what for what that's just a word that triggers curiosity so it's like our inner child that comes through and wants to explore the world and for is like the adult version of ourselves which gives direction right so it's this what for and <clears throat> 
maybe we can all just ask ourselves, you know, what for do I put my energy into what I'm currently doing? And I think if we answer that very question, we will just all, you know, put our energies more into what really matters. And that is what I would like to contribute for now, Maitri. Thank you very much, Muriel. Um, I see we have many questions coming through and we don't have too much time left. So uh, if the panel doesn't like, I just would like to just go through some of the questions and then whoever feels uh, they could answer, if they could please contribute. Some of them are directed at um, the mindset of post-COVID, you know, uh, questions like from Mr. Mayak and wants to know, 100% remote work is it dangerous to mental health is some of the questions coming through. People are also asking um, uh, about food uh, production, you know, will it work with the distancing, you know, thoughts please on how do we reconnect and I think, you know, a lot of people are post COVID also asking how do we reconnect back to humanity because we're now with the social distancing. So I think this one is working from home dangerous to mental health quickly i think uh, lena i think maybe you could take that one Lena. is it dangerous to be working from home is it dangerous to mental health your thoughts yeah i think everything is uh, with moderation and it's, it's all about the mindset and the awareness that we do things from uh, there are individual differences and needs and preferences, of course, when it comes to working from home. Some are more um, internally driven. Uh, they're very self-driven and able to balance their work from home very well, while others need the structure, a social structure around them to function well. They need the, um, the social input and so on. So it all depends um, on your overall life, I would say, if you can balance uh, and uh, be mindful of not uh, exposing yourself to a too di uh, heavy digital load, um, then it could absolutely work. Uh, and I think there will be more acceptance for this and more freedom of choice. Um, the other question that's come up is, given that COVID requires physical distancing and food comes from natural world where physical work is required, now with digital work becoming the new norm, is it doable in isolation? Um, Saju, I think maybe you can answer that. Could we be producing food in this way, in this digital world is the question. Can we reconnect the human to the natural world and still produce enough food for all? Uh, I, I personally feel it's very uh, uh, it's a very good question, Gregory Millen, and thank you for that particular question. And uh, I would say that till date we have been a consumer of food, and I think it is time to come. Uh, uh, a time has come where we have to be a prosumer, which is a producer consumer of food. And I think what has kept us away from food production is we always assume the food has to be produced by a farmer. And we have never been involved in that particular ecosystem of food production. I think if it is a technology driven, like an Amazon for food production, I'm sure you yourself can become a farm owner and produce the food and make it available. And that's what my talk was about, where the farming in India and the world is going to be more technology platform driven, where you as a consumer will also become a producer. So where the physical distancing like what does Amazon provide us? We used to be physically close going into a shopping mall, going into a store to buy items. But Amazon gave you that physical distance where you don't have to be there. It gets delivered to your house. So same with regard to the food production. When it becomes a technology platform driven food production, you need not be physically close to the farm, but you can still produce and you can be part of that prosumer technology that we have to adopt gradually, where you become a producer as well as a consumer. Um, 
we have another um, uh, a remark. It's about remote working, online learning, and digital transformation. Any thoughts on that in the future and the changes? Um, uh, Peter, would you like to contribute? I mean, you're very much into the sector where we're also preparing students for entrepreneurship and development. Would you like to take that question? Hello, hi. I forgot to press my mute, apologies. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, 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 the education learning system hasn't changed. Um, for centuries, the model the model needs uh, um, a complete realignment of how we learn today. And I think um, you know one of the things I will say is that you know during this whole pandemic crisis, you know online working or remote working, virtual learning, as we we call it today, it's not nothing new. What's really been new is the whole lockdown, not being able to get out of your house or your apartment, etc. And I think that's what's really affected everyone. And especially, you know, here in Milan, for example, um, you know, where apartments are, are tiny, uh, there's only one window, um, you know, it, it becomes, you know, uh, mentally really, really tough for people to deal with. But when we talk about, you know, the, you know, the, the remote learning, online learning, the digital transformations, um, I think it's one where we really have to realign and readapt to what is needed today to learn. And, you know, what are the tools that are going to help us in, in, in that perspective? Uh, and again, I think that's where your entrepreneurial potential kicks in for me. I think everyone, um, you know, becoming an entrepreneur is not something you learn um, uh, or, you, or you, you know, say one, one morning I'm going to wake up and, and do this. It's something that's within you. But the ability to, to think and, uh, I guess, be creative and to learn things is one thing that we can adapt from an entrepreneurial perspective. We look at some of the amazing entrepreneurs out there. So um, I, it, it's a it's a real long. Uh, uh, I, I guess it's a it's a tough question to answer in a short space of time. Um, but I think there's gonna we're gonna need to re readjust and, and reproduce tools that are going to help us learn. Um, and I think it's about um, embedding ourselves into a new augmented world of learning. Um, that brings, for example, the future of what's out there and create this virtual world that's safe, but then you can pick it up and put it into the real world. And I think that's where, for me, the future of learning is going to be progressive. And learning by doing is absolutely going to be key. One thing we don't do today in education, education is all about we learn, we learn, we learn in a very specific way. But what we don't do is apply the real world to it. What actually happens? Um, and I'll give you an interesting point here in that um, I was working on a really uh, very, very interesting project. And I got to introduce, uh, uh, to introduce some real high pro CEOs across Asia in the banking world. And I remember when I asked them, what was their biggest challenge they had as a CEO of a bank? And the answer was they could not find talent because when they put talent in, um, when, they, when they believed they found that talent to be able to make the right decisions, those decisions couldn't be made because they didn't know how to make those decisions. And that's because academically we're driven in a blindfolded way. So I think that, you know, for me, the future of it all is where we need to really change our perspective and, and throw learning into it in a, in a more learning by doing environment. We have uh, three minutes, four seconds left. I would love to wrap up the session um, and I would love to have some final uh, quick thoughts on the whole uh, issue moving forward. Um, if you don't mind, Arvin, I'd like to come to you. Um, any last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with as well as then Solange? Yeah, uh, I'll be very quick and short. I go back to my earlier point. Uh, I use, I'm just using analogies. I think the world is moving from a masculine space to a feminine space. I use that analogy uh, not with any derogatory interest. It's just the way I'm describing it. Uh, so we are moving from a world where brawn is less important. It's, I mean, already the significance of brawn has gone down. Uh, we are moving from a world where very focused linear thinking, analogous thinking can be done by computers now. Uh, 
what is more going to be required in the future is multitasking the ability to think uh, creatively emotively uh, so all of these things actually ha- have been less focused in our schooling systems uh, we've always given a higher priority to male thinking or masculine thinking or that's just the way i'm describing it feminine capabilities are more as i said towards multitasking more towards uh, creative thought process um, we have structured in our organizations very linearly those structures have to change we will have to operate in the future not like organizations of the 20th century more like entrepreneur uh, kind of management styles offline working trust working and so on Uh, there's a lot to say not enough time i'm going to leave it to solange to wrap this up thank you very much solange your final thoughts my final thoughts looking into the future i see a landscape that is full of competence centers so right now we're having these you know two extremes of like the corporate world and the startups and i think this is like melting more and more together whereby you know each individual has the chance to bring in his or her competencies into different hubs and uh i think the the preparation for that is by by really like i can just like you know um reinforce what arvin just said you know like really the congruence between you know both parts of the brain plus the brain and the heart you know and bringing that all together and yeah we human beings were more than machines and machi- machines are now taking over so that gives us the space to go back to you know that essence that we truly are and can con- contribute to all kinds of societies well thank you very much everyone thank you horizons global it seems our time is up and hopefully we can find a way to work together and move together to the future Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye Thank bye. you. Take care everyone. Bye bye.